How many of you have ever been adopted or how many of you are adopted? No? Okay. I, I can tell you that uh, when my parents split up at, and I was five years old when it happened, uh, my dad took us out of the apartment. We were living with my mother and drove over to the neighbors and we sat there in a the car for a bit. And he said, see that car pulling up over there? Said, yeah, he says, that's the lady from the adoption agency came to take you away. I don't know whether it was true or not. I heard a lot of things in the years uh, that I, I really questioned. And uh, there are a lot of facts that I can't wait to get to heaven to find out what the truth is about it. But I did spend the next 17 years living with my grandparents. Awesome, awesome people. Well, there were some tough times. Uh, they were very disciplinarian, uh, but I loved them dearly for no other fact than they took my two brothers and myself in and raised us. But this scripture is about being adopted into the family of God. You see, we weren't born there. Even though we've always been God's children, we've never, we may even yet not be part of that adopted family, but I'll let you figure that out for yourself. One of the things I'd like you to know before I read this is that the Romans had a very strict uh, method of adoption. And if a, a young man or a, a person wanted to leave their family and become part of another family, they could. But in order for them to be adopted into that family, their father, their birth father, had to sell them. And what it happened, what happened was, and this was all, uh, it wasn't actually happening. It was symbolic. What he would do is he put them up for sale three different times. And the first two times he would buy them back. But the third time he didn't. They decided that after the third time that the person still wanted to join the other family, that they could let them go. And at that action or that uh, form of adoption, they uh, would join the other family. All of their debts in that former family were forgiven. It was like you became a newborn, a fresh born uh, person. Everything in your past was gone. Family, debts, everything was gone and you joined a new family and everything that they were. Paul speaks of this in the midst of it. But listen to what he writes us. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, and you will live. Obviously, we all know that what this is speaking about is uh, spiritual death, earthly death and spiritual death. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. The spirit that you received from the new family made you part of the new family, the sonship or the daughtership of the new family. In this case, the family of Christ. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. As you all know, and probably realize is that Jesus had to suffer. He had to suffer and he had to die. But the key to this whole thing is he had to be resurrected. If Jesus had not been resurrected, all this would be moot. We would have no chance in hell. Actually, we would have a chance in hell. Uh, and, and that's just the way it would be. But Jesus set an example for us to follow. And we hear this every time we do communion. But we are saved and joined into the family of God because of what Christ did for us. Now at verse 18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation awaits an eager expectation 
for the children of God to be revealed. Heaven and earth wait for us to be resurrected. They wait with bated breath. They wait with hope. They wait with all kinds of expectation for us to be risen from the dead so that we can join them in heaven. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. Wow. Creation itself will be liberated and brought into the freedom. Can you imagine what it's going to be like when we get to heaven? When we all get to heaven. You know the tune. Wow. I honestly can't wait. I mean, this, the words tell us and, and history has told us that we all get an opportunity. Uh, a lot of it depends on how we behave here. We're all God's children, but, and that's a capital B, there are stipulations. We have to recognize Jesus is Lord. It goes on to say in verse 22, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to the sonship. How many of you are waiting for that adoption day? Waiting, waiting, and waiting. You know, a lot of times when we pray for stuff, uh, we only have hope. Uh, we haven't seen it happen. Uh, we only know what we've been told, but it, it sounds so good. We can't wait. It's, it's kind of like, kind of like a hunter in the woods standing there half a day waiting for a deer to come by and you know, they're out there. You just know they're there, but they haven't come yet, but you know, they're there or or like uh, a mother and father waiting for their son to come home from the war. You know he's coming. You got the telegram or you got the phone call. You know he's coming, but wow, wow, I can't wait. It's coming. Just... For in this hope we are saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they, are, who hopes for what they already have? Is there any sense in hoping for something that you got in your hand? Really, I mean, it, it's like a, like a woman who, who was just given the news that the property she lives on is worth a million dollars. Really, I mean, she, that piece of property that she's living on, it's the only home she's got. She doesn't have any chance of going anywhere else, but that piece of ground she's living on, it's hers. And it's worth a million dollars. But the only way she can get that million dollars is if she moves out. But she's hoping that someday, someday she'll have that million in hand. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait patiently. There's the crux. Who's patient? <laughs> yeah, right. I can see it. December's coming, right? Yeah. Yeah, I wait patiently. Not. No one, no one, including Jesus Christ, earns glory by suffering. We don't have to suffer. We don't have to suffer. There are some things we have to do, but we don't have to suffer. Even Christ, rather, as Paul works to describe what it means to be a joint heir with Christ, he notes that the joint heir's life is characterized by the same pattern that shaped Christ's life. To be connected to Christ is to know disgrace and praise. To be joint heir with Christ is share in Christ's suffering, death, and resurrection. Yeah, this is no easy ride, but there are costs involved. 
James Dunn, Forder Lightfoot Professor of Div the Divinity at Durham University, says he names solidarity among Christ, humans, and the rest of creation when he says believers are being saved not from creation, but with creation. The sonship that they are privileged to share in some sense with Christ, they ter in turn share in some sense with creation. It comes, it goes, it lives, it dies. And so do we. As I explained last week, we are all made up of the same molecules that make up the dirt in the ground. We are all made up of the same stuff that those beautiful trees or that field of corn or, or even the woodchucks in the backyard are made up of. He says the gift of the Spirit reclaims a believer for God and begins or heightens the tension between humans belonging to God and human entrancement with a world of human control and success, the warfare between spirit and flesh. Paul says our flesh is not only body, but the sin that it inhabits. When he speaks of the flesh, he's talking about the base human being. We live in sin. We serve in sin. We are surrounded by sin. But there is an opportunity for us to be cleansed and forgiven. Wow. But one of the causes of suffering for those who have received the spirit of adoption is the spirit has given us reason to hope for more than we can see. The definition of suffering is broadened in the rest of the chapter, verses 35 through 39. It says, they include anything that threatens to separate us from God's love. Think about that for just for a second. I am who I am because of the love of God. I live the way I live and where I live and who I serve because of the love of God. I'm nothing special. Really, I'm nothing special. Never have been, never will be. God's given me certain gifts to be able to stand here in front of you and relate and share the love of God. But I started out just like all the rest of you. And my path has led me in this direction. We all have a path to follow. And if we allow it, God will lead you in the way that he wants you to go. Thank God we're not all preachers. Thank God we're not all electricians. Thank God we are all not the same. God's love gives us an opportunity to do something that we enjoy. We are part of creation. We are not because of creation. It closes with this. For we are saved in hope. Who hopes for what he sees? Paul says we were saved. We were saved in hope. And then he reminds us that hope that is seen is not hope at all. The idea here is that we've been saved. And that's not in doubt. But we have yet, experienced the full, have yet to experience the full force of salvation. We are like the homeowner who's been told that her house is worth 10 times more than it really is. But then she can't get it yet. Yet. In many cases, that million dollars is gone after she passes so that the family can enjoy it. You see, one day all of us will be called home. One day all of us will see that hope. One day all of us will join in a happy reunion with all the rest of our adopted brothers and sisters in the heavenly glory. And for the rest of eternity, we will no longer have to hope. We can celebrate. We can praise God loudly. We can praise God to the top of our voices or whisper. God will hear it. And so will everybody around us and join with us without fear, without regard of people 
talking us down. We'll all be of the same mind and the same heart. Why? Because we're all adopted into the family of God and all loved by the same Father. Amen? Let's pray. Okay. Yeah, let's pray to, play to. Heavenly Father, it is with joy that we recognize that we are your children. Oh, this adoption isn't completed yet. We know that the ultimate price has been paid, but we're just not complete. And so we pray that we might continue to hope, not be disillusioned or, or uh, depressed or uh, that we might have the hope so that we could be the people that we need to be in order to allow others to see the joy that we are experiencing because we have that hope that we are loved and that one day without forgetting or without disappointment we'll know that we were blessed by you and we will be joining you in that great family and beyond in jesus name we pray amen